O God, open our minds that we may know you, open our hearts that we may love you, open our lives that we may take your good news to the world. Amen. Amen. Mary pondered these words in her heart. It was so much easier to believe last night, she thought, when shepherds quake and glory stream from heaven afar, it's easy to trust that divine love and justice will prevail. Yes, childbirth is hard, but the rush of endorphins and other hormones dampened the pain and made joy possible in the midst of it all. Last night, everything seemed possible. This morning, however, is a little different. She had to face up to it. The angelic beings and the adoring crowd have gone home, and all that is left is her own fuzzy memory of what it was like. In the daylight, already this baby looks less ethereal and far more ordinary than he did in the moonlight. Already the swaddling clothes are soiled because that's what babies do pee and poop and even throw up a little when they have to. It was so much easier to believe last night when everything was glowing and fresh and new. Last night, she could hear the angels sing. This morning, she's not so sure. Despite the song she sang months ago in response to Gabriel's message, the mighty are still on their thrones, and the rich are still full, and it's the poor who are going away empty. What happened to that promise God made to Abraham and all the forebears of Israel? What of that promise of mercy? Over 20 years ago, my husband and I and a study tour group from the U.S. sat in a shallow cave near Bethlehem. The grotto fit that picture and popular imagination of Jesus' birthplace a lot better than the glittering church in Nativity Square. It was rough, accessible to shepherds, and with a view of the sky where angels might be seen to dance. We read the story of the nativity and then asked the question of the group, if Messiah has been born, if the word has become flesh, has it really made a difference in the world? In the harsh light of day, can we still believe that God has entered the world and made it new? Which is real? the night of jubilant shepherds and beauteous heavenly light, or the dawn that reveals all the pain and poverty and despair that is still to be healed. Which is the truer story? The inauguration of a new mayor with its orations of hope and promises of a bright future, or the day after, when it becomes clear that it will take more than just clearing methadone mile to bring peace and healing to those who need it most? Does the day after zero out the hope of the celebration before? Which is a truer picture of reality, the great achievement and sigh of relief at a vaccine for a deadly disease, or the realization that even that is not enough? It's been said that as Christians, we always live in Advent, in the waiting between Christ's first and second coming. Salvation has begun, but it is by no means finished. And it's so strange that even on Christmas Day, we're still in Advent. Strange but true. Even our favorite Christmas carols won't let us forget that we're still in that in-between space. The third verse of It Came Upon a Midnight Clear makes 
no bones about it. Yet with the woes of sin and strife, the world has suffered long. Beneath the heavenly hymn have rolled 2,000 years of wrong. And warring humankind hears not the tidings that they bring. Oh, hush the noise and cease your strife and hear the angels sing. As much as Episcopalians love to remind the world that we are all about incarnation, we also understand that incarnation is not magic, but mystery. As much as we love our candlelight carols, we get that the morning after is no less holy, no less charged with the grandeur of God, as the poet Jared Manley Hopkins wrote. And we understand that it's not enough to wait for the baby and then throw out the Christmas tree for another year. We keep listening for the song of the angels, and we keep trying to sing with them as we wait for the final coming of Messiah and God's reign of peace. So this morning, after all the hoopla, can you hear the angels sing? Maybe not at first, but listen again. Can you hear it? The song is different than it was last night. It's quieter, perhaps less triumphant, but assured nonetheless. Last night it sounded like the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, or the St. Paul's Choir, which is even better. <laughs> this morning, it is a delicate melody drifting in and out on the wind. Last night it was Gloria in excelsis, in harmony. This morning, it is the humbler hymn of love to God and neighbor in whatever way we can manage it in this hurting world. This morning, it is, as T.S. Eliot wrote, music heard so deeply that it is not heard at all. But you are the music while the music lasts. So don't fret. The song is still there. The word has become flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Which means that the fullness of God, not an intermediary or a second tier deity, God has entered fully and joined with a real human person, a baby who lived, died, defeated death, and will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. It means that because he was, we are the music while the music lasts. Last night we heard the angel's song clearly again, so that in the quiet and hard moments of the coming year, we know what to listen for. Where will we hear the song of the angels in the coming days and months? Perhaps in the cry of another newborn baby. Perhaps in the reversal of an unjust criminal conviction. The birth of the word in our midst means that the song of the angels is in us and everywhere. Whenever a child claims their own pronouns, chooses a new name, and is upheld and cherished, we can hear the angels sing. Wherever grief and loss are met with tenderness and acknowledgement, we can hear the angels sing. Whenever love is our token, we can hear the angels sing. Fear not, for I bring you tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. 
Christ is born and with the angels, we and all heaven and nature shall sing. <laughs> 